All right, uh, welcome back to quantum field theory. In this semester, we will do uh, three different uh, lectures and seminars which have to do with theoretical particle physics. Uh, one lecture on Monday is called Standard Model Advanced Theory, and there was already some lectures. There we will do, of course, uh, applications of the standard model of particle physics, which is an application of quantum field theory, and the stress will be on actual calculations in QCD and in the electroweak standard model and QED to understand the technologies and the physics output uh, of the standard model. Here in quantum field theory two, uh, this will be a successor of the two quantum field theory one lectures that we had, namely uh, in the year 2019-20, there was quantum field theory 1A, as I might call it, which has a stress on uh, causality, the combination of relativity and quantum mechanics and uh, renormalization and renormalization group methods and uh, the lecture is fully on video and sometimes I might refer to it. And in the year 2022-23, we had what I might call quantum field theory 1B, where the stress was on spin not equal to one, spinors and vector bosons and the specific treatments of the quantization of in particular spin one having to do with gauge invariance. And, uh, uh, I will, of course, also refer to that one. And here in quantum field theory two, we will now follow up on both, and we will discuss path integrals, then the quantization of Young-Mills theories, uh, the theory of symmetries, and in particular, symmetry breaking, spontaneous symmetry breaking in particular, and then uh, the big chapter on effective field theory, which is a very important uh, and modern a chapter on quantum field theory. And then in addition to the two lectures, there is a Haupt seminar, which uh, is of course intended for master students and the topic is generally gauge theories, uh, where you will discuss in particular, uh, let's say, uh, the pioneering works of gauge theory, where you read original articles with the original insights and the key ideas of basically uh, the people who had all these uh, thoughts for the first time. We are, uh, there are usually like very interesting side comments and uh, specific ways of and points of view that are lost in the modern lectures because there we streamline everything so we gloss over the important uh, discussions of the early days. Okay, so that is the outline and now let us begin with our first uh, section of quantum field theory two, which is path integrals for quantum field theory. And I know that in the normal theory master lecture of the master program, you always learn about path integrals in quantum mechanics. Therefore, I will not focus on the general uh, problems and uh, subtle details of path integrals, which are generally true in all quantum mechanics uh, applications, but I will focus on those um, specific details which are important for quantum field theory. So in particular, I will not focus on mathematical um, details and uh, formalism and so on, but I will focus on our uh, needs for quantum field theory. Okay, and uh, let us begin nevertheless with the idea which you uh, certainly know. Namely, the idea is uh, coming from Feynman and Feynman was asking what is actually the basic quantum mechanical question according to Feynman. The basic quantum mechanical question that you can ask is about probability amplitudes. What is the probability amplitude for a certain process I at time ti going into uh, state f at time tf. In other words, the amplitude, let's call it curly A, 
so that you end up with a particle at position xf at time tf and you come from xi at time ti. Okay. So what that means is you prepare a system in a state, a position eigenstate at uh, xi at a certain time ti. Then you let the system evolve according to its quantum mechanical nature. Then you make a position measurement at the time tf and you find the outcome xf. So these are system prepared and then measured at time ti and f at position xi and xf. And then the question is, what is the probability amplitude to find that result? And the key insight that goes into that question is, of course, first of all, that quantum mechanics is a theory of probabilities. You cannot always predict exactly the outcome of any experiment, but you can predict probabilities. And the second insight is that probabilities are actually the absolute squares of certain probability amplitudes. And the probability amplitudes are complex, and there can be constructive and destructive interference. All of that insight already goes into the question, and then you ask what is actually the result for such a complex probability amplitude for a specific process. So that is the key question of quantum mechanics. And then, heuristically, you get insight from the double slit experiment and in the double slit experiment, you start here, let's say on the right, with your particle at xi at time ti. And at the end, you want to measure it. And uh, the measurement result might be xf at the time tf. And in between, let's have a double slit. Then the particle could go either through the upper slit or it could go through the lower slit. And uh, the experimental analysis of the double slit experiment tells you that the probability amplitude behaves in the following way. Namely, you have probability amplitudes for all the sub-processes. There is a probability amplitude for the particle going from here to there or from here to there. And then also probability amplitudes from here to the final position and or from the other slit to the final position. And these four individual amplitudes, they combine in a very specific way. And the way can be tested experimentally. And so from the double slit experiment, you would see that the amplitude uh, A x f t f from x i t i can be written as a sum over the two slits. Let's call it slit number one. And therefore, we have a position n1 which can be either one or two. And then you have a probability amplitude that the particle goes to the final position from x n1 at time t1 times the amplitude that the particle goes to the slit n1 at time t1 coming from the initial position xi at time ti. So you have a factorization if you have one path, like through the upper slit, then the amplitude for the upper path factorizes into a product of amplitudes for the two individual parts of the path. And the overall amplitudes for both different paths, they sum up. The complex amplitudes sum up. That is the outcome of the experimental analysis of the double slit experiment. And this is one of the key insights of quantum mechanics. And if you now imagine, as Feynman did, that you have not one double slit, but you drill many more holes into the slit such that many more paths open up, then the sum here would extend not from one to two, but it would extend over all these many, many, many different open holes in the, in the slit. So you would, would might maybe have a sum from one to a large number or even to infinity if you drill infinitely many holes. 
if you drill continuously many holes, then the diaphragm is just gone away and you have an integral over all these intermediate positions. And then you can put in many more such uh, diaphragms, drill infinitely many holes into them and then you have a multifold sum. And therefore, if you think this through and you take many slits, then you will get the idea that the amplitude that we want to have is actually the following. It is a multifold sum and you can take the limit of the number of these diaphragms, capital N, you can take the limit of that going to infinity. And for every diaphragm you have, let's say, a variable N1 which goes from 1 to infinity up to Nn going from 1 to infinity. And then you have here the product of all these many, many different uh, individual amplitudes from one slit to the next. Let's say the last one would be this. Position X N capital N at time T capital N, many factors, and then X N capital N at, uh, sorry, at 1 T1 from Xi at time ti. So, and what we have here is basically a sum over all infinitely many possible intermediate times and all possible intermediate positions. And that can be written by definition as a path integral because this thing here basically corresponds to a path. The particle goes from the initial position to some position at time t1, then a certain position at time t2, and the times are very, very densely spaced, and therefore this is essentially what we call a path integral. And I write it with a curly d, curly d x of t, that is the integration measure, and the integrand is now an amplitude which depends on the path x of t. So, and I write it with square brackets that denotes that this here is a functional of the path. So this here is a functional Functional means that uh, the argument is a function x of t which connects the initial point and the final point and in between it is some uh, path and uh, the amplitude is then uh, the output of that particular path and it is a complex number which can be uh, viewed like in the line before. And this integration measure is basically defined by the line above by taking this limit of up to infinitely many intermediate points and positions. Uh, defined by uh, first line and the integral is over all paths connecting the final point and the initial point. And then we have our answer to our basic quantum mechanical question, namely the answer is the amplitude for such a process uh, from one position to another one between two times is given by the integral over all possible paths connecting the two points over am amplitudes where for each path there is a complex amplitude defined. And the integral over all those complex amplitudes gives us the amplitude for the actual quantum mechanical process. Okay, uh, that's it. And that uh, could be viewed, of course, as a definition of quantum mechanics, which would then be independent of operators, of course. So you could put that at the starting point, or lecture one of quantum mechanics, and obviously Feynman does exactly this in his quantum mechanics lectures. Then uh, if you want to specify concrete dynamics 
for a concrete system, of course, what you need to do is to specify that functional. What is actually uh, the concrete amplitude for a certain concrete path? That is something that you would then need to specify, and once you specify it, you have defined a specific quantum mechanical system. So the concrete dynamics lies in the choice of the functional A, which uh, gives an amplitude for any specific path. And of course, if you want to build up a quantum mechanics lecture uh, from this starting point, as Feynman does, you can do it, and then you would now go on uh, and figure out lots of heuristic arguments by comparing with experiment and get some insight how you should choose that uh, functional amplitude as a function of the path such that you get agreement with experiment and then you get very far in this way. And uh, you can read this in the books by Feynman. So that could be obtained heuristically. See, for example, Feynman lectures, uh, volume three, and also uh, the book by Feynman, Hips, on quantum mechanics from the path integral point of view. Now that is very nice, and uh, for sure you know this already, but now there is one particular drawback in the path integral approach. And that drawback is actually a famous question uh, that uh, Dirac asked Feynman when Feynman presented his path integral idea at some conference. Then Dirac was apparently asking, what about unitarity? And uh, I mean, according to the quotation, Feynman also didn't immediately know what is meant by the question, what about unitarity? So you might also wonder, what about unitarity? What do we mean by unitarity? Whenever somebody says uh, plainly unitarity in quantum mechanics, what we mean is the unitarity of time evolution. That means that a uh, state evolves in time with a unitary operator, and the um, physics implication of that is that the sum of all probabilities always adds up to one. For any time in the future, the sum of all probabilities of all possible outcomes must add up to one. And that uh, simple requirement is, of course, necessary in order to be able to interpret quantum mechanics consistently as a probability theory. If at some point the probabilities do not add up to 1, but to 1.5, for example, the interpretation would uh, get lost. And so that was Dirac's question. So let's write it down. The meaning of the question is that the sum of all probabilities should always be one. And whether they are or not is not obvious from the path integral setup. That is the drawback of the path integral. And on the other hand, this unitarity is the key advantage of the operator approach. Here, unitarity is manifest. So in a way, the operator approach is an approach where in quantum mechanics, this property is built in right from the beginning and uh, you cannot overlook it. It's automatically guaranteed to be true. Whereas in the path integral, uh, it might correspond to a very, very complicated proof or theorem and so on. Okay, and so therefore, we have here two formalisms of quantum mechanics with two different um, advantages, namely here the intuitive picture of the path integral and lots of elegant um, formulations of uh, 
uh, complicated systems and the unitarity of the operator approach. And so therefore we should now combine the two and combine both advantages. Somebody has destroyed this, it seems. <coughs> Fantastic. Okay, good. So let's briefly recap the operator approach. Just as a side note, uh, in the operator approach, you have the Schrödinger picture. In the Schrödinger picture, the time evolution of a state goes like this. You have a state uh, which depends on time in the Schrödinger picture. So let's call Schrödinger picture with a subscript S for the states. And then uh, the states satisfy the time-dependent Schrödinger equation. I d by dt of that is equal to the Hamiltonian applied to the state itself. But you can solve this if the Hamiltonian is time-independent, just like this. e to the minus i Hamiltonian times t applied to the state at time 0. And then you have here a Hermitian Hamiltonian. And once the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, the time evolution is unitary. Okay, so here you see the manifest unitarity of the operator approach. Let's uh, also recap a few other properties of the Heisenberg picture. In the Heisenberg picture, the states are time independent. And we use the convention that at time zero, the state in the Heisenberg and Schrödinger picture is equal. And uh, then the time dependence resides in operators. So an operator in the Heisenberg picture, which I denote without subscript, uh, is at time t given by e to the i Hamiltonian times t times the operator at time 0 times e to the minus i ht. So uh, the sign is opposite here to the Schrödinger picture state evolution. Then another point uh, in the Heisenberg picture, you can define the following state, which you might not be so familiar with, I don't know, but which is very useful to have uh, to compare with the path integral. Because in the path integral, we started with our basic question, let us prepare a state at time ti in a position eigenstate xi. Uh, and at the end, we have a position eigenstate xf, but the time is tf. So what are actually those states? Those states which are appearing in the question of the path integral would correspond very nicely to Heisenberg picture states, where the state for example, the initial state is an eigenstate to the position operator, but the time-dependent position operator at time ti. And the final state would be an eigenstate to the position operator at time tf. And you know, the position operator at time ti and tf, they are different operators. So therefore, these are eigenstates to different operators. And so what is useful to have is now a position eigenstate at a certain time t. And uh, let's give it a name uh, x comma t. So this is a Heisenberg picture state which is time independent, but it is defined 
to be an eigenstate to a certain operator at time t. So that is the notation and uh, it satisfies the following equation. Here is the Heisenberg picture operator for position at time t and it acts on our state and then that should be an eigenstate with the eigenvalue x. Okay, so that is the defining equation of this Heisenberg picture state and now you can answer uh, what do we know about that state. Um, so the position operator at time t is related to the position operator at time t0 in this way. So if we define the following e to the i Hamiltonian times t times the Heisenberg state at time zero, then it works. Then this would be an eigenstate of the position operator at time zero. And if you plug in uh, all the exponential functions, they drop out and you see that the state defined such is an eigenstate to the position operator at time t. And so now we have a handle on the states that we actually need for our path integral description. And so you see interestingly, the time dependence here is opposite to here. So here you have the minus in the exponent, here you have a plus in the exponent. So let's just notice this is not a misprint, opposite to Schrödinger picture. And it is a different meaning. <coughs> so just as a small exercise, who is able to explain the difference in the meaning between this time dependence and that time dependence in physical terms? Who is able to explain why these two states here, this one and that one, mean very different things? What is the different meaning? Anybody able to explain it while I clean the blackboard? Who tries to explain the difference between this time dependent state and the other time dependent state? So for t equals zero, for t equals zero, this means a state which at time zero is a position eigenstate. Okay. For t equals zero, let's suppose that at the top is also a position eigenstate at t equals zero, then they mean the same thing. Then you do a time evolution of the state at the top. What does it mean? The time evolution of the state at the top is in the Schrödinger picture, so in the top you ask, at time zero, you prepare a state in the position eigenstate. Afterwards, you let time evolve. The state evolves, it becomes different, it becomes no position eigenstate anymore, it becomes a spread wave packet, whatever. And uh, the psi of t is exactly the time evolution of that state, which at one point was a position eigenstate, but it has evolved away from being a position eigenstate. This here, however, is a state which at time t corresponds to a position eigenstate. So if you uh, look at that state, then it means uh, in the past it was whatever, but at a certain point in time t, you prepare it to be a position eigenstate. So at time t, this is very different from, from the other state. It's basically the opposite. <coughs> and that is also why we have here the opposite sign in the exponent. Okay. So now let's go on. So we have now, let's write it here, uh, the notation to rewrite our path integral question A, x f t f from x i t i, we can now write it in the operator language. Namely, it is nothing but the following scalar product, x f t f, scalar product with x i t i. That is our amplitude in the path integral. So you prepare a position eigenstate at time ti, you measure at time tf, and the outcome is a position eigenstate at time tf. So that's the very simple formulation of our amplitude. And in the Schrödinger picture, you can write it like this. 
You have just the position eigenstate in the Schrödinger picture. And in between, you have the unitary time evolution, e to the minus ih, tf minus ti, times the Schrödinger picture position eigenstate at uh, time ti. Okay, So these are the two ways to write our amplitude. All right, let's continue. Now we have discovered that our path integral has a drawback, namely we do not know about unitarity, but we know about unitarity in the operator formalism and therefore we will now derive the path integral from the Hamiltonian. So this is what you do or what you already did in the master lecture. So this is now motivated. We start from operators. Suppose we have a quantum system which is defined in the canonical formalism. So it is a specific version or a specific class of quantum systems where the Hamiltonian is given by a Hamiltonian function coming from classical uh, canonical formalism where we input uh, operators Q of t and P of t. And those are canonical variables uh, which you can view as generalized position and momenta. And uh, in classical they would satisfy Poisson brackets and in quantum mechanics they satisfy canonical commutation relations at equal times qi of t, pj of t, gives the uh, i times Kronecker delta ij. And uh, just let me also introduce here the notation for fields. For fields, uh, fields are nothing uh, special in this regard. Fields are just uh, canonical variables where the index i is continuous and refers to the space position x for fields, so this qi of t would become, let's say, a field operator phi i of x and t. So you see the index i uh, is now basically uh, expanded into a, maybe a discrete index for the type of field and a continuous index corresponding to x vector. So the position x it's nothing but an index of canonical variables. At each space position, there is a degree of freedom sitting. That is a field theory. And then, of course, the Kronecker delta becomes Kronecker delta times a three-dimensional delta function between x and y. But so fields are nothing special in this respect. So and here now for simplicity, Let's uh, use only one degree of freedom and drop the index i entirely, but everything we do can obviously be extended for many um, indices. So then if we have such a specific quantum system, then in uh, the operator approach, we know exactly what our question, um, what the answer to our question is. Namely, we plug in here the Hamiltonian from that quantum system and then we have our uh, answer to the amplitude. And that we can now use in order to evaluate the path integral. And remember the path integral consisted of uh, intersecting the interval from Ti to Tf into 
very, very many very small time steps. And so the only thing that we now need to look at is one of those very, very small time steps. So we assume in our limiting procedure, we, have all, we are already very far. We have many, many intermediate points with many very, very small distance between them. So for capital N, very large. And the time step delta t, which is tn plus 1 minus tn, very small. We can write down the following. Uh, our amplitude just going from one time step to the next. And let's now, in this uh, setup, call it qn, qn plus 1 at time tn plus 1 coming from qn at time tn. This is now in the Schrödinger picture. The following here position eigenstate qn plus 1 and then here e to the minus i Hamiltonian times uh, delta t times qn. So this is what we now need to evaluate in order to get one amplitude for one time step. And once we know that one, we can build it all together. OK, and in order to compute this, uh, this is a standard calculation that you certainly did in quantum mechanics. So since the time step delta t is very small, we have here an exponential function. It is sufficient to uh, use the first order expansion of the exponential function. Then we just have the following expectation value, namely unit operator minus i times Hamiltonian times delta t between the two position eigenstates. Then as the next step, we insert a momentum eigenstate basis. And uh, we do that at this point. And uh, so let's do that. We have an integral. We call the integration variable Pn, because that fits to the variable Qn. Then we have here the following, qn plus 1, then the unit operator h. And h is actually a function of the position operator at time tn, comma, uh, momentum operator at time tn times delta t. Then we insert our pos uh, momentum eigenstates, pn. And at the end, we have our position eigenstate qn. So then what we have here is a matrix element between a momentum eigenstate and a position eigenstate. And in between, we have a non-trivial operator which contains position operators and momentum operators. But uh, the position operators act here on the position eigenstate. Therefore, they will be replaced by the eigenvalue. So here, we can replace that by the number qn plus 1. And the momentum operator can be replaced by the momentum eigenvalue Pn. And then this becomes a number. The number here can be pulled out of the quantum mechanical matrix elements. So maybe let's write it in words. We can replace Q hat uh, by Qn plus 1, which is a number. We can replace P hat by Pn, which is also a number. Then the whole argument is a number, which can be pulled out of the quantum mechanical matrix elements. And then what remains is the matrix element between position eigenstate and momentum eigenstate times momentum eigenstate times position eigenstate. And such matrix elements between momentum and position eigenstates, they are known. In position space, you know that this is an exponential function e to the plus minus i p q. And here in this case, it is e to the i times p n times q n plus 1 minus q n times a normalization factor, which is irrelevant. OK. And then we can plug that all in and use again that uh, the time step delta t is very small. So we can put the linear form again into an exponential function. And then what we get is dpn over 2 pi 
times the following integrand, namely e to the i times pn times qn plus 1 minus qn. That comes from the matrix element between position and momentum eigenstates. And then from here we get minus the Hamiltonian function with the argument qn plus 1 comma pn times the time step delta t. That is the result. And so here you see uh, appearing essentially uh, this uh, object, which is similar to the Lagrangian, but not yet quite the Lagrangian. But anyway, this is uh, the result for one infinitesimal time step in the path integral. And if you now go back to the full path integral, it is a product of uh, many, many such expressions. The product of all these expressions means you can combine all the exponential functions where you have a sum of all the exponents and the sum of all the exponents basically corresponds to an integral over all these intermediate positions uh, qn and pn. And so therefore, let me write it here. The final result from this analysis is the following expression, namely our amplitude from uh, to qf at tf from qi at ti. This amplitude is now a path integral over all possible paths q of t, which interpolate between those points, and uh, all paths p of t, which interpolate between the pn's, times the following uh, exponential function, e to the i, times an integral of uh, p times q dot minus h of q and p integrated over dt between the initial and final time. And then we have found the argument of our path integral. However, the path integral is a little bit different from the beginning. Namely, we do not have only an integral over the actual paths in position space, but we have also now obtained an integral over the momentum space paths as well. But our integrand is now known. And in principle, you might now evaluate the dp integral, and then you get exactly the expression from uh, the intuitive picture of Feynman. But that is what you can directly derive from the operator formalism. Let me add some comments here. So as I just said, you could in principle evaluate this momentum space path integral, and then we obtain the form of uh, our section 1.1. Uh, the generalization to many degrees of freedom is obvious. It's just a matter of notation. If you have many degrees of freedom, you would say that this uh, symbol uh, dq of t, dp of t, actually contains, by definition, a product over all degrees of freedom. So all degrees of freedom i, dqi of t. And similarly, you multiply over all momentum space degrees of freedom. And for each degree of freedom, you have such, such a path integral. That is obvious. Otherwise, there is no change. Now, an important point and subtlety, namely the operator order. And this is something that I will not discuss in detail, but you can spend uh, a lot of time to discuss this point, um, because uh, 
in the operator formalism, obviously the commutators between operators are in general non-zero. In the path integral, there are no operators anymore, so you wonder what happens to the commutators and to operator ordering. And here we have made an implicit assumption assumed in the Hamiltonian, namely uh, it corresponds to what I wrote, namely all the Q operator are left of all the P operators. Let's continue. Ah, okay. An intermediate topic. Transition matrix elements. So let's consider the same situation as in section 1.2 and uh, now however we look at a more general amplitude let's call it simply a which is now the following we 
take our Heisenberg state at position QF and time TF and our Heisenberg state at position QI and time TI, but in between we now have operators. In other words, we construct a matrix element of operators and for the beginning let's just put one operator O hat or O, which is again a function of uh, the Q's and P's in this order P of time T0 Q at time T0. So we put in one operator which is a function of P's and Q's at one particular point in time. And uh, this is not a misprint, but uh, we choose here the operator ordering opposite to the Hamiltonian. Opposite to the Hamiltonian. Okay, this just again makes the derivation simpler, otherwise of course we would have to face with a little bit more intermediate steps, but uh, that is no loss of generality. Okay, so what uh, can we say about this matrix element? We can uh, again write down a path integral formula for it. We can uh, put in lots of time intervals and uh, in doing the time intervals what we will now do is such that one of the intermediate times coincides with this time of that operator and then there are some time intervals later than the operator and some other time intervals earlier than the operator. And uh, the time interval that uh, we need to look at is the one which contains the operator. So the thing that we need to uh, change in our derivation is the single time interval which is very, very small and just contains a time step delta t but which contains the operator. All the other time intervals uh, are as before. So proceed as before, but one particular step is such that some time step Tn coincides with our T0 and at this step the following happens. We will need to evaluate this Qn plus 1 and here Qn and in between we have our uh, time evolution Hamiltonian, e to the i h times delta t, and here we then have the operator which depends on p at this time t n and q at this time t n. And now as before we expand that in linear order in delta t and we insert momentum eigenstates and now the momentum eigenstates can be inserted at this position. If we insert the momentum eigenstates at this position, the same thing happens as before for the Hamiltonian. Namely in the Hamiltonian we replace the operators by the eigenvalues. But then also this new additional operator sits between a position and a momentum eigenstate and the operators are ordered accordingly. So also here we can replace all the operators by the corresponding eigenvalues. And then just going through the same steps as before, we end up with an integral over this intermediate momentum and we have the operator evaluated at uh, Pn, Qn numbers times the exponential of the same as before namely Pn times Qn plus 1 minus Qn minus the Hamiltonian uh, times delta t with the appropriate arguments. And so if you connect uh, all the loose ends, then you will now see that the path integral for the full amplitude basically looks as before. Um, you have the same uh, path integral over all the possible paths of P and Q. You have the same exponential with an integral between the t initial and final time. And in between you have this operator which depends on the path. But before writing down that formula, I will uh, yet 
introduce another generalization. Namely, you can, of course, do the same for many operators. Uh, but the thing is, they need to be time ordered. They need to be time ordered such that Tf is strictly bigger than, let's say, Tm, strictly bigger, and so on, than time T1. And that is strictly bigger than time Ti. Then uh, the setup works, and then we can write down the following thing, namely uh, the amplitude Qf Tf and here qi ti and in between many time ordered operators operator uh, at the very left has the biggest time um, let's simply say at time tm then operator at time t1 and this time is smaller than that time and so on this time is smaller than tf then for each intermediate step, uh, the same thing happens as for this microscopic detail that we have looked at. And the final result of everything is the following path integral, namely path integral dq and dp of t. And the argument is now operator. Uh, OK, and let me also give different operators. Let's call it om and o1. So this might be some function of p's and q's. That might be a different function of p's and q's. And then we have here om of the path p of t, uh, q of t, and so on. And here operator o1, which is a function of p of t and q of t, tm, of course, tm, t1, sorry. T1, and then the exponent e to the i um, integral of p q dot minus h of q and p integrated over dt. Okay, so this is a general formula, which is very important also for us in quantum field theory. And a side remark, which uh, you see here from the derivation with the time steps, is that you can only reproduce from the path integral such a time-ordered product of operators. If you would want to know uh, a matrix element of the opposite ordering, you cannot do it directly with a path integral. Path integral can only reproduce time ordered operator products. Fortunately, time ordered products are extremely important in quantum field theory, and so this is exactly what we get from the path integral. OK, and so this is basically now the final result of the path integral in the Hamiltonian formalism, which is able to give us quantities which we really need and want in quantum field theory. Good. That is a nice result. But of course, it's not yet the end, because we want to uh, get a connection to the Lagrangian also. This is still Hamiltonian. And uh, here in the exponent, you see something which looks a little bit odd. Uh, I, I mean, you know it, of course, I guess, uh, because that uh, looks like the Legendre transformation back to the Lagrangian. But it is not the Lagrangian, because the Lagrangian is this thing after replacing the piece by q dots by using the relationship coming from the Legendre transformation. But here, the p's are not replaced by q dots. The p's are independent variables, which are integrated over. And uh, they take values which have nothing to do with the values specified by the Legendre transformation. Therefore, this is a much more general object than the Lagrangian. But it is the one which appears here in our path integral. Now, we want to connect it to the Lagrangian. And uh, under special conditions, this can become the Lagrangian. And then uh, we can integrate over the piece and obtain a path integral which depends only on the actual paths in position space, which is more intuitive 
and here we get the Lagrangian and the action in the exponent. But I warn you, it is not completely generally true, but only under certain conditions. And these are the conditions which we will spell out because those conditions are also uh, something that is important for quantum field theory. And uh, so this is one of the details that I want to focus on. And uh, using those details and those relationships, you will also see why and under what conditions the path integral is a huge advantage in quantum field theory. Okay, so that is section 1.4. Path integral from the Lagrangian and just a general picture which I always uh, stress is that of course what is the advantage of the Lagrangian formalism? It is of course symmetries in the Lagrangian and in the action the symmetries are manifest, uh, like in particular Lorentz invariance, translational invariance, those symmetries are manifest in the Lagrangian formalism, but not really manifest in the Hamiltonian. On the other hand, the Hamiltonian, as we saw, has the key advantage of manifest unitarity. And uh, if we connect both of them simultaneously to the path integral, then of course we have the best of all three worlds. We can combine the elegance of the path integral with the known properties of symmetries and unitarity from the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian frameworks. And that will exactly be the outcome, namely if you are in this class of theories where everything works, then the path integral gives you a definition of quantum field theory where Lorentz invariance is completely manifest at all steps of any calculation. And that is the key advantage. So let us begin, however, with an intermediate step, namely with Gaussian integrals. Uh, until 10.50, right? Mm -hmm. So Gaussian integrals. So integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dp of e to the minus one half a times p square. Okay. Gaussian integral uh, is a square root of two pi. But if you have the a here, you get square root of 2 pi divided by a. So this is a Gaussian integral. Now, uh, that is what you know, and uh, okay, I guess you know more, but uh, let's go step by step. For example, what happens if you have this modification? Uh, you add here a linear term. You have the Gaussian form uh, with a square p square with a coefficient, but you also have a linear term j times p. Then, uh, in order to evaluate it, you can do uh, complete the square. We can complete the square. What happens if we complete the square? Then we get e to the minus uh, one half a, and then p minus j divided by a square, right? Then we have completed the square. And uh, then we have an extra term which we must subtract plus 1 over 2a times j square. Then it's the same as before. And now you see that by completing the square, we can simply shift the integration variable. Then uh, the first term is just the ordinary Gaussian integral with the same result as before, square root of 2 pi divided by a. But then we have an extra term in the exponent e to the plus 1 half uh, 1 over 2a times j square. So yet another um, generalization would be the following. Let's do it in many dimensions, multi-dimensional Gaussian integral. Let's say uh, 
we have an exponent which I call sigma. Sigma is now one half and then let's have many variables. So P is now, let's say, a vector with many components, P transpose times a matrix A times P, okay? Uh, plus, uh, whatever, plus J times J transpose times P. So also J is a vector with many components. And then we write it in this uh, mathematical matrix notation. And let's just, uh, before going on, check what happens if I take the partial derivative of this exponent sigma with respect to one variable, pi. If I take the derivative with respect to one of those components, then here that matrix is of course symmetric. So I will get the one half cancels, just the matrix A times P with overall index I plus Ji. So then the question is, what is the multifold Gaussian integral of all these different um, variables, P1 to Pn? Uh, of e to the minus sigma with this exponent. Then we have again a shifted Gaussian integral, but in many dimensions. And uh, okay, you can think of this um, by first think of that matrix as a diagonal matrix. If this is a diag diagonal matrix, then of course the exponent is simply a sum of individual exponents for any component p you have a normal Gaussian integral. And then you have, this is simply a product of many Gaussian integrals for each variable individually, and for each variable the result is this one, uh, where A corresponds to the eigenvalue on the diagonal of the corresponding matrix. So what you will get is here the product of all the diagonal elements of the, your diagonal matrix, which is the determinant of the matrix. And that is simply true also if the matrix is not diagonal. If the matrix here is not diagonal, think of diagonalizing it, going to a different variables by an orthogonal transformation which doesn't change the integration measure. And then of course the result is the same and you again get the determinant here. So what the result is, is two pi to the power n for each dimension. And here you have the determinant of that matrix A and then uh, what remains is here this thing, e to the one half, and then we can write it like this, j transpose times the inverse matrix times j. And uh, that can now be written in a certain way. First of all, the normalization factor is irrelevant for us, but uh, it exists, so let's just abbreviate it as some normalization factor, which we will not uh, bother to care about. But this result here uh, can be obtained in the following way. This is nothing but e to the minus sigma, where we do a certain replacement rule, namely in the sigma we replace p by p star, where p star is the extremal position. p star is defined by the condition d sigma, uh, sorry, d sigma derivative with respect to dp at p equal p star vanishes. D sigma by dp at p equal p star vanishes. What does that mean? It means that p is the extremal position of our exponent, the maximum or minimum. If you think of this being an action, then it would be the place where the action is minimized. Uh, what does it mean concretely? So here is our derivative. If we put that to zero, you see that j is now equal to minus a times p or in other words, p is equal to minus a to the minus one times j. If you plug in that particular p equal minus a to the minus one times j into that expression here, then the p becomes this a to the minus one. So that goes into uh, one half times uh, 
exactly this expression. So you, you get this expression from here with prefactor minus one half, and here you get the same expression with prefactor plus one, and then in the end you get exactly this expression. So you see that the Gaussian integral can be written in this verbal uh, form by not writing down a formula, but by remembering the following sentence. In order to evaluate a Gaussian integral, take some normalization factor and just write down uh, your Gaussian integrand, but evaluate it at its extremal position. That is the result of the Gaussian integration. So that is a very nice way to remember the results of the Gaussian integrals which we can use because obviously minimizing something like an exponent sounds like minimizing an action doing a Legendre transformation. So this rule of evaluating Gaussian integrals comes in very handy if we want to evaluate this and see that it corresponds to a Legendre transformation. And therefore, Let's write it really as a sentence, maybe here. So I wanted to write down the following sentence. So also for functional integrals, if we have such an integral, functional integral dp of t, of e to the minus sigma, where sigma has such a form, then the result is some normalization factor times e to the minus sigma, where we put p equal to this p star, where d sigma with respect to p at p equal p star vanishes, and this holds if sigma is now as a functional integral dt of one half p transpose a times p plus j transpose times p, where these are all functions of t. And of course, a is invertible. Otherwise, the formula becomes undefined. Uh, sorry, I tend to have not enough space here uh, because I wanted to write down something else. Let's put that here. Okay, and the generalization is the following. Now, we have established this point. After having established it, now let's think of taking derivative with respect to j. What happens if you take a derivative with respect to j on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of the equation? If you take a derivative with respect to j, what happens in the sigma? Sigma depends linearly on j. If you take a derivative of the exponential function with respect to j, you pull down the prefactor p in front of the exponential function. So a derivative with respect to j will produce here a prefactor p of t. Second derivative with respect to j will produce here p square. Third derivative will produce here p cube and so on. So by taking some uh, derivatives with respect to j, you can produce here in front of the exponential a polynomial in p. Therefore, uh, since you can freely take derivatives with respect to j on both sides of the equation, uh, the result will then still contain here this uh, exponential uh, with a minimized action. Therefore, the statement remains true even if we have here a polynomial in front of the exponential. Remains true even for the case where we have a polynomial in P of t times e to the minus sigma.
And that means we have now very nice and very general rules how to evaluate Gaussian integrals which we encounter in the context of path integrals. And uh, having said that, we can now, I think, uh, finish the lecture by deriving the famous relationship to the Lagrangian and the path integral. That is now a piece of cake. Let us derive the desired relationship to the Lagrangian in a simple case. And later, uh, probably this afternoon, we will generalize it. Let us consider the following Lagrangian, which looks as simple as this, m over 2 q dot square plus c of q times q dot minus v of q. So it's already not completely simple, it's uh, semi-simple. Uh, because it's not uh, like you would normally have in classical mechanics with velocity square and the potential, but I allow here even for a linear term in the velocity. Where do you need a linear term in the velocity? Uh, maybe. Or in the uh, coupling to an electromagnetic field of a point particle, if you want to uh, describe the Lorentz force which is velocity dependent. Then you have exactly this, which you typically do now in your master. Are you now, didn't you attend the master lecture last semester? Most of you? Yeah, so there you probably discussed Aaron of Bohm, where you need this linear term. Anyway, so it's already a semi-simple case. And uh, let's discuss it. So the Legendre transformation is P is uh, dl by dq dot is now m times uh, the velocity plus c of q. And the Hamiltonian, if you go through the steps, becomes p minus c of q square divided by 2m plus the potential. Okay. So this is again the same as in the coupling to an electromagnetic field where you would have here the product of the vector field potential, a vector, and uh, the velocity. And in the Hamiltonian, you have p minus a vector, the vector potential square. This is the minimal coupling to the electromagnetic field. So it's exactly the same sequence of steps. Let's not worry about it. But now we can evaluate the path integral. So the part of the path integral which depends on the momentum, dp of t. Um, and uh, let us allow here some operators which only depend on q. Therefore, they are blind to the integral over p. And then we have the exponent e to the i integral of p q dot minus h integrated over dt. Now we look at this and uh, we ask, can we actually integrate over p? And we look at the integrand. The integrand uh, is here an exponential function. And in the exponent, we have a quadratic function of p. Namely, here we have p times q dot, which is linear in p. And here we have something which is quadratic in p. It also contains linear terms in p. But anyway, it is of the form of our sigma that we have discussed before, with quadratic terms and linear terms and terms which are independent of p. And of course, the quadratic term has a prefactor 1 over 2m, which is invertible. Therefore, all the conditions are satisfied, and we can simply say the result of the integral is exactly that exponent at the point where p minimizes the exponent, where the derivative with respect to p vanishes. That exactly corresponds to the Legendre transformation. So this is of the above form. Therefore, the result 
is a normalization factor. And what is important about the normalization factor is that it is independent of the variable q. It is a constant, independent of q. So it contains no dynamics, no physics dynamics. It's independent of q times uh, e or times the operators, which were independent of p, and then times the exponent p q dot minus h integral over dt evaluated at p equal p star where p star is defined such that the derivative of this thing with respect to p at p equal p star vanishes but I mean that corresponds to Legendre transformation. If you evaluate it, what does it mean? The derivative of this means q dot is equal to the derivative of h with respect to p. That is exactly the Legendre transformation to L. And therefore, the result is proportional up to these normalization factors to e to the i integral over l depending on q and q dot integrated over dt. So that is the result of this lecture under this condition that we have a Lagrangian which contains velocity square times a constant coefficient and a linear term in the velocity which might contain a q-dependent coefficient and something depending only on q. Under this condition, we can evaluate the path integral and go back to the fully uh, Lagrangian form, which looks like this. And there is an even more general um, condition under which the same result is also true, which is then less simple, and we will discuss that in the afternoon, and then I will write down the fully nice formula with all the statements, path integral equal to uh, something, and so on, with all the details. But here, at this point, we can stop. We have managed to prove that for this Lagrangian, we get the desired result, which you already know. And uh, tomorrow, uh, in the afternoon we will generalize it and draw some further consequences. Okay, but let us stop here and uh, see you later.